Yep, we can hear Good you. Good afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, Keisha, for uh, getting us in. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining FY20 Second Chance Act, addressing the needs of incarcerated parents and their minor children, also referred to as COIT, Grantee Orientation Webinar. My name is Erica Nelson, and I'm a project manager and technical assistance manager at the Council of State Government Justice Center. Before we begin, I have a few technical notes. If you encounter connection or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3233. This number is also posted to the chat box on your screen. Unfortunately, there are some connection issues we may not be able to resolve during this webinar. However, we are recording today's webinar and will post this webinar onto our website along with a copy of the presentation slides. Everyone who is registered for the webinar will receive an email as soon as the webinar is available on our website. At the end of today's webinar, we'll have time for questions from grantees. To ask a question, please enter the question into the Q&A panel on the bottom right corner of your screen. You can ask questions at any point during this orientation, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible before we end today. Joining me today as presenters are Kathy Mitchell, Program Manager at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, Lisa Hall, Case Manager Administrator at Oregon Department of Corrections, Sherry Sandoval, Director of Corrections Program at the Pathfinder Network, and Milo Dietrich, Program Manager at the Pathfinder Network. During today's orientation, we will introduce you to key partners for the Addressing the Needs of Incarcerated Parents and Their Minor Children grant program. Presenters will provide an overview of the grant program, including goals, objectives, and deliverables. We'll also provide key tips for getting your grant program started, including an overview of the planning and implementation guide. Also, administrators of the Parenting Inside Out Phase 2 Enhanced Visitation Pilot Project will share their experience implementing their Second Chance at COIT grant program, including navigating restrictions and policy challenges due to the current COVID pandemic. Also, we'll share key next steps for all FY20 grantees. And during the final portion of today's webinar, we will address questions. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Kathy Mitchell with OJJDP to talk about the Second Chance Act and key partners for the program. Thanks, Erica. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar today. I see some familiar names um, as participants, so I'm glad that all of the grantees were able to join us today. Um, so the Second Chance Act supports state and local and tribal governments as well as nonprofit organizations to help reduce recidivism and improve outcomes for people leaving incarceration. The Second Chance Act has supported over $500 million in reentry since its inception, and it builds and strengthens the initial landmark legislation that was originally passed. Next slide, please. So throughout this partnership that you all have, um, have become members of as grant recipients, um, we funded 14 um, grantees this funding year. Um, you all are comprised of state and local and tribal organizations. There are a lot of Department of Corrections agencies that will be implementing this work. Um, OJJDP is the funder, and we will be working with the 
um, Council of State Governments Justice Center who will be providing training and technical assistance. And many of you might be familiar with the American Institutes for Research because they have been recently um, the TA provider for this work. Next slide, please. And so our mission here at OJJDP is to provide national leadership, coordination, and resources to prevent and respond to juvenile justice and delinquency victimization. Through our efforts, we help develop and implement effective and equitable juvenile justice systems that enhance public safety, ensure that youth are held appropriately accountable for both crime victims and communities, and we also are really proud about empowering youth to live productive and law-abiding lives. So Erica, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, the Council of State Governance Justice Center is a national, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that combines the power of a membership association representing state officials and all three branches of government with policy and research expertise to develop strategies that increase public safety and strengthen communities. Our agency develops research-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities and delivers training and technical assistance for Second Chance Act grantees focused on behavioral health, housing, and family support. We have over 100 staff members that can offer a range of content expertise, project management support, and connections to peer networks and resources. As the TTA Center for COIP grantees, our agency will provide peer learning opportunities, resources and tools that will assist grantees reach their programmatic goals and integrate the latest research available to reduce recidivism, improve family engagement, and other reentry outcomes. Each grantee will have a designated technical assistance coach. I will serve as a technical assistant coach, as well as my colleague, Valerie Carpico. Valerie, um, please introduce yourself to the group. Hello, my name is Valerie Carpico, and I am a senior policy analyst um, with the um, council as well. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself briefly. I previously, um, prior to coming to the Justice Center, worked in reentry and program coordination, focusing on jails and prisons. Um, a strong area of behavioral health I focused on and including stepping up coordination. Most of my career has been spent in corrections, child welfare, TANF, and SNAP, and I am based out of Ohio, and I am very excited to work with the grantees providing technical assistance. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Val. Grantees will also have experts to access to experts within our agency at the Council of State Governments, as well as partners. Um, such as our partner and at the National Resource Center on Children and Families of Incarcerated. And would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Yes, hi. Hi, everyone. It's really exciting to be with you. Um, I am the director of the National Resource Center on Children and Families of the Incarcerated at Rutgers University in Camden, New Jersey. Um, I'm in my 42nd year of doing this work, and we began, <clears throat> I began in the 70s running a program for incarcerated parents and their kids in a county jail. Um, the Resource Center began during the Clinton administration um, looking for programs around the country to evaluate and support that were serving children and families of the incarcerated, and I was the director of that for the last couple of years. And then we joined forces with a Virginia organization to really sort of zero in on providing training and technical assistance to correctional de departments of corrections, um, correctional programs, and community programs. And we joined Rutgers in 2013. I'm a child and family therapist by training, so a lot of my work tends to 
also include information about how to apply research and concepts around trauma and toxic stress to, to children with incarcerated parents, um, and also parenting. And so the mission of the Resource Center is to, number one, include the, the children, adult children and the families in defining the problems and designing the solutions. So we do a lot of, of focus groups to get information from the families. We combine that with accessing the most up-to-date and accurate research we can. And we use that to train and inspire and provide technical assistance to folks like all of you and people working in other systems like education and law enforcement, um, child welfare and mental health. And then finally using that, all of that together to help inform public policy, uh, public policy and also systems policy. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of this um, with the Justice Center and to um, be available for all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and so, you guys, as Grant TC, you have a very strong team here with the Justice Center and our partners, as well as OJJDP, to make sure that you guys have the support you need to reach your grant programmatic goals. Again, uh, Val and I will serve as a technical assistance coach to grantees. Uh, we will have monthly calls with grant program teams, with your grant program team, to plan for the rollout of your grant program, discuss program progress, troubleshoot implementation challenges, and provide advice and expertise on implementing key aspects of your program with fidelity. The planning and implementation guide will be key to ensuring your program is implemented in the way that best suits the agencies involved and the jurisdiction where the program is being implemented. We will share resources as needed to assist with planning and implementation. We will develop quarterly peer learning opportunities and conduct site visits when it's safe to do so and based on the needs of grantees and the funder OJJDP. Our agency will work in partnership with AIR um, which operates the National Reentry Resource Center, also known as the NRC. The NRC is a collaborative project between BJA and OJJDP to advance the knowledge base of the reentry field. That means supporting agencies and organizations like yours who provide services and support to people who are reentering communities from prison or jail systems as well as people with a history in the justice system that are seeking information about where and how to find reentry support. So we have a polling question. We actually have two for the audience. Um, we would like to know if you have previously received the OJJDP award, please indicate yes or no. Uh, as well as have you previously received a Second Chance Act award, um, please indicate yes or no. And we'll just give maybe 20 seconds for people to complete that. And then I'll ask Keisha um, to close out the polling so we can see where folks are falling. I know Kathy mentioned she saw a lot of familiar names in the chat box, so let's see. Uh, who has had a previous award. And in just a few seconds, we'll tally the results and be able to display them on the screen. Okay. All right. So um, we have quite a few folks who have had um, a previous OJJDP award, um, about seven folks indicated as such, when 17 indicated that they have not. Um, and I, I would say a, le a rather large portion of you all may have not had a Second Chance Act award. So for um, many of you that are on the line, this will be your first experience maybe going through the technical assistance process as well as um, just implementing a Second Chance Act program. Um, and we are so equipped to help you to do so. 
So thank you all for participating in the polling. Um, we will now move on to agenda night item number two, which is the program overview. So the Council of State Governments Justice Center and OJJDP will really want to extend a congratulations to each FY 2020 grantee. There's a total of 14. Um, I really want to hear um, from you all whether or not you had an opportunity to review the grant program descriptions for uh, your peers that are in your cohort. Um, can I get a show of hands from the group if you were able to review those program descriptions prior um, to today's uh, webinar? Okay, looking for some hands. Okay, I see Rebecca, Deb had an opportunity. Okay, so quite a few folks. All right, so, which is pretty good. This is going to be one out of many ways um, which grantees will get to know and learn about their peers that are doing this great work. Um, and also, identify a few strategies that they may want to adapt as a part of the implementation of their grant. Okay, I have another question. I'm really interested in understanding from the group what you are most excited about as you initiate the rollout of your grant program. And I will include that question in the chat box. Okay. And feel free to respond um, to the question. Really just want to know what you're excited about um, when it comes to initiating the rollout of your grant program. Okay. All right, so we'll move on. Um, okay, I see Rebecca there. She says working with her great partners. That's pretty cool. Others, feel free to jump in and include information in the chat box to respond to the question, which you're excited about, and we'll continue on with the uh, presentation. So addressing the needs of incarcerated parents in their minor children program provides funding to support state and units of local government to develop activities that foster positive family engagement between incarcerated parents within detention and correctional facilities and their children who are under the age of 18. The program also supports the children of incarcerated parents by providing services that reduce the likelihood of antisocial behavior and future involvement in the juvenile justice system. The goal of the program is to assist states and localities in developing or expanding services that meet the needs of incarcerated parents and their minor children to prevent violent crime, reduce recidivism, and provide support for minor children. Key objectives include providing support to facilities for staff, equipment, tools, resources to create trial-friendly spaces within detention and correctional facilities, develop safety protocols and procedures for children who are visiting their incarcerated parents, developing programs and services that support the needs of parents and their children, while the parent is incarcerated and as the parent transitions to the community from correctional custody. Key program de deliverables shown on this side correspond with the objectives just mentioned. One area I'd like to highlight is the second bullet on this slide, 
which is uh, to provide services that meet the need of children who are incarcerated, I mean, children who have incarcerated parents, excuse me. Studies show that 2.7 million children, or one in 28, have a parent behind bars, which can cause a reduction in education attainment for the child, as well as negatively impact other factors such as economic prosperity and household stability. In addition to serving parents, it's important for grantees to think through how they are delivering services in a way that directly impacts the children's growth. There are a number of activities that can be done to reach the deliverables expected as part of the grant. In previous cohorts, we've seen grant partners, grantees partner with agencies and service providers to develop or expand evidence-based and best practices and services to incarcerated parents and their children, including providing parenting classes, supervised in-person, and virtual visits. Also providing training for correctional officers to include safeguarding children and families visiting incarcerated parents, as well as adverse childhood experience or ACE training. Support the delivery of community-based services to meet the needs of minor children with incarcerated parents, as well as provide connections to transitional services and support for parents as they're returning to the community from correctional custody. And this can include workforce development, employment services and support, substance abuse and mental health treatment, legal services, and housing assistance. Now let's talk a bit about key activities a part of the planning process. It is expected that grantees would use about six months to plan for the implementation of their program. The planning process will be guided by a TA coach and the P&I guide will play a key role in the planning process and grantees should work with their TA coach, we also refer to them as TA providers, to complete the guide and submit to OJJDP program managers for review. The planning and implementation guide is a tool developed by the TTA agency, us, at the Council of State Governments Justice Center in partnership with your funder, OJJDP, and the National Reentry Resource Center. The tool is used to stimulate discussion amongst project teams to come to an agreement on the goals, approaches, and matters that require problem solving. The key questions and areas noted in the guide helps your TA coach assess for potential implementation challenges and work with the program team to identify options for overcoming barriers. It, is all, um, it also helps organizing key information for grantees, the TA coach, and OJJDP. The guide includes a section on a section that has key resources to consider when al aligning grant activities with evidence-based practices and research-driven strategies. It is an evolving document that will be revisited and updated as your grant project progresses over time. The P&I guide will be shared with grantees around the time of your second or third TA call. There are seven sections to the guide. The first section will capture grant details, including points of contact for the grant, including the OJJDP program manager, the, your TA coach, grantee point of contact, 
Um, it will also include information about funder approvals and adjustments to your grant, known as uh, grant adjustment modification, or we call them GRAMs, and request for no-cost extension. Section 2 helps grantees organize details regarding their partners and key stakeholders and advisors, including role and responsibilities in the project. Section 3 documents evidence-based practices and models that will be used as part of the grant and help with developing a plan for rolling out these practices. Section 4 is what we call the action plan, which assists with organizing the goals, objectives, and activities of the grant and timelines, as well as progress for completing each activity. This section will be visited often as it will also assist with assessing barriers to implementation and flag grantees to work with their TA coach to overcome barriers to implementation. Section 5 helps grantees plan for reporting as part of their grant, including submitting key information for performance management. Section 6 assists grantees that have an evaluation as a key component of their grant, document the purpose and goals of the evaluation, the design and key questions the evaluation is attempting to answer. This section also helps grantees think through what data will be collected and how. Section 7 helps grantees work with their TA coach to develop a sustainability plan. And believe it or not, you should be working on your sustainability plan from the moment you receive your grant, not towards the end. Finally, there is a resource tab that your TA coach will update on an ongoing basis with links to resources, as well as information on how these resources relate to information in the different sections of the guide just mentioned. The final draft of the PA PNI guide should be shared with your designated OJJDP program manager, either Kathy Mitchell, who you heard from earlier today, or Jane Smith. Contact information for both program managers as well as TA coaches are provided on the last slide of this presentation. So now I'll turn it over to Lisa Hall at the Oregon Department of Corrections and her grant program team to share a bit about their FY18 Second Chance Act grant program and lessons learned from implementation. Lisa? Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Hello, everyone. Um, Oregon Department of Corrections and our long-term partner, business partner, Pathfinders Network is happy to participate in this um, presentation. Um, my name is, again, Lisa Hall, and I am the Correctional Case Management Administrator for the Oregon Department of Corrections. And last spring, I inherited the Children of Incarceration Parents Program, and I have participated in this grant and since, I think it was April, and we are in our, we are in our last year, our third year of the grant. The Parenting Inside Out Phase 2 program provides a special focus on strengthening positive parenting practices through individual and group coaching on communication, connection, and planning for life at, for the parents' um, release. Next slide. Next slide, please. The goals of the parenting program, phase two, is to improve our parenting skills through enhancing our visitation for our adults in custody, to use strategies that foster the parent-child bonding relationship, to enhance the parent-caregiver relationship, and to also encourage positive family engagement and to reduce parental stress and depression during their incarceration experience. Our phase two enhancement visitation pilot project goals were to enhance 
safety for correction staff and facilities by providing parents the prison attitude adjustment and reduce the, the number of parents experiencing disciplinary infractions. And here I would like to hand the slide off to Sherry Sandoval. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, I am Sherry Sandoval, Director of Corrections Path, uh, with the Pathfinder Network. So we work um, in partnership on many projects with the Oregon Department of Corrections. And the objective for our Parenting Inside Out Phase 2 Enhanced Visitation Pilot Project um, was many folds. I'm, there's obviously the bullet points on the um, slide, but I'd like to just kind of expand a little bit on um, what all of this means. And so our objective is to help parents um, develop a reentry parenting plan so that they really can be focused on being successful upon reentry and um, especially with their relationship building with their um, with their children. And so as we know, many children, when they have incarcerated parents, experience um, severe, you know, social and emotional um, impacts to their life. And so it can be very challenging. And so by helping parents, you know, build that reentry plan and to build a relationship with their children uh, before being released and having, you know, that set is really um, one of the main objectives. Next slide. And then we also, you know, just build off of that. It's not just the relationship between the um, parent and the child, but it's also all of those uh, family members or support systems that the incarcerated individual may have. And so we want to make sure that we um, establish the, that relationship as well. And so by doing that in this, in this program, we have um, the opportunity for the caregiver and the child to come to that enhanced visit at the institution where the parent is housed. And then in addition, they have um, video visiting and telephone calls. And um, during that, you know, the video visit, we have our coaches supporting the parents and the caregivers and the child in ensuring that it's just a really um, in, well-rounded and meaningful and productive uh, visit and that they, you know, there's some learning and some uh, relationship building and, you know, just a focus for the future of what this, the family unit can look like upon release. And then um, super important for us in our, our partnership with the Department of Corrections is also just understanding the ins and outs of having um, security staff that are involved in these visits and how they can be different from just regular visits and really um, providing some training to security staff around trauma-informed um, emotional intelligence and, and just being able to have them understand both sides, every side of, of the members that are coming to these visits, whether it be the caregiver or the child or the parent, um, you know, that when a parent leaves and goes back to their, their cell after a visit, there can be some emotional things that, um, that happen from that. And so just having a training so that, um, everyone involved really just understands, uh, the way the brain works and the way that our emotions work and really helps to make the visit and after the visit successful. And with that, I will turn it over to Milo. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Milo Dietrich. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm gonna assume that's a yes and move forward. Um, thank you, Sherry, for the overview um, of our PIO Phase Two Enhanced Visitation Program. Um, I've been um, the manager of the program um, since the P&I guide stage, um, so I just can't reiterate enough um, what a valuable tool that is as you're really looking at, you know, what your, your hopes and dreams and, and outcomes were that you identified in your application and, and how you can really put that into practice, um, especially in our current context. Um, I understand that a lot of folks, you know, probably, you know, all of you were 
formulating what this project would look like before we were in this landscape that we're in now. Um, and that was certainly the case for us. And so I think, you know, when we talk about accomplishments and lessons learned, um, so often these go hand in hand. Um, our accomplishments are, are directly tied to things that we're learning as we go. Um, and so, you know, one of the main things that I really want to identify is this idea of, of pivoting with purpose during a pandemic. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes um, and unknowns that your that your project might encounter with, um, you know, ac actual physical access to the institutions. Um, will you be able to have visits? Will um, areas of an institution be on a lockdown because of COVID or, or other issues? Um, and so one thing that I think that we've really learned is to, you know, take a pause um, and, and really look at what, what, are, what are the outcomes that we're working towards and what are new ways that we can get there? Um, what are the things that we are, you know, really hooked onto that we have to do as part of our grant and as part of our, you know, our, you know, outcomes, and what are those things that we can, that we can tweak and that we can adapt in this new moment? And so I think, you know, having that almost on a daily, weekly basis where you're asking yourselves those questions and saying, okay, given where we are today, you know, how is it going? Um, and I think a big piece of that um, is that buy-in and collaboration that you're going to have, you know, with your, your either community or your correctional partner, depending on, you know, you know where you sit in your project. Um, but really taking time to build those relationships and understand, you know, what are the pain points um, for your partners? What are the barriers that they're experiencing? Um, what are the things that they're most proud of and the work that they're doing? What's going well? Um, so that if, as you're working on innovations and, and new ideas about how you might meet the need, you know, you're aware of um, the things that are most important to the people that you're collaborating with. Um, so that's been huge. I think, um, you know, looking down, you know, this first item on the slide of recruitment, um, that's been a big area of, of pivoting for us. Um, you know, we originally had two sites, two state prisons, where we had planned to operate the program, um, which was really, as you know, Sherry, you know, talked about, um, built around these in-person enhanced visits. Um, and after, you know, our first cohort um, concluded, you know, all visiting within our prisons ceased. And it's, it's almost been a year now that there has been no in-person visiting. So, you know, in collaboration with Oregon Department of Corrections, um, as the Pathfinder Network, we, we were able to, you know, kind of zoom out and say, okay, if in-person visiting isn't possible, um, that means we're not necessarily tied to these two institutions. We can um, expand to other institutions um, where phone or video would be the option um, for those parents to be able to have contact. Um, so in some ways, you know, you might find those silver linings where, you, you know, in one way you, you had a great offering, but it was restricted to less folks. And in this way, we, we can't offer that same thing, but we're able to support more people. Um, and that kind of goes into that pro the program delivery piece, which is that, um, you know, initially everything was in person, um, you know, in, in small groups with a once monthly one-on-one -on -one coaching session. Um, and over the course of the last year, you know, we've pivoted several times to doing um, in person, to, you know, phone coaching, to one-on-one um, -on -one in person, to, you know, groups sometimes. And we're starting to move into doing, um, you know, like email messaging between our coaches and our incarcerated participants. So. Kind of every 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 new group that we work with, um, we're just continuing to kind of look at what tools are available, what's going to work best um, for our parents that are on the inside and our children and caregivers on the outside. And you know, as Anne mentioned um, earlier, you know, really centering 
your participants, really centering the parents and the children and, and finding out what's going to work best for them, um, what their needs are in this current moment. Um, I think that you'll find um, you have a lot more buy-in from participants um, and a lot more sustained motivation um, when folks are really centered at, at, during what's happening, um, especially when we have so many unknowns right now. Um, so in terms of our curriculum, um, that's also shifted a lot from being in-person, you know, very hands-on workshops where we were able to bring out toys and books and do role plays, um, to then going to packets sent by the mail, um, to then doing a bound workbook. Um, and I think, you know, again, every time that we, we implement a change, we, we find things that are working well and things that aren't. Um, and while, you know, I think in an ideal world, we would run it as designed um, and then see what changes we want to make later, when the, the ground is shifting underneath us so, so frequently, um, I think it's important to be able to, to take advantage of those opportunities to shift and change and, and meet the moment. Um, I think, you know, lastly, just some tips that um, in talking with our coaches, um, things that have helped them be successful through these unknowns um, is, you know, really bringing that empathy and understanding when working with participants, um, being responsive to what's going on in the moment, um, and then, you know, asking yourself, you know, where choice points can be built into your model um, and where you can have kind of more wiggle room and flexibility. So, you know, if, if this happens, then we will do this. But if this happens, then we might do this and have that be built in from the get-go um, so that you can, you know, be moving with those changes as they happen. Um, I think lastly, um, if you are going to be using um, technology more than in-person visiting, um, really working with the participants in your program to understand that technology, um, because that can be a real barrier. We found with our, with our folks, um, the systems aren't always super intuitive, and so becoming an expert yourself um, on how those work um, so that you can really be that partner um, in getting folks connected um, can be huge. Um, lastly, just um, on that front, when you're looking at adaptations, I think for us a major lesson learned is that, you know, when you go to remote programming, um, there's people that, that aren't going to be served the way that they deserve to be served. Um, you know, when we consider language, when we consider learning styles and all of those things, you know, who are we, um, who are we excluding when we modify our programming and how can we mitigate um, those things and ensure that um, we're really being equitable in how we're responding um, to the moment. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, working with our partners at DOC and supporting correctional officers and supporting parents that are on the inside, um, you know, I think a major lesson we've learned is, which Sherry touched upon, was that we, it's not just the officers that are in a visiting space um, that are interacting with parents. Um, every staff person who interacts with an incarcerated parent, whether that's in the visiting room or the corridor or the dining hall or, or their, their cell, um, that person's a parent 24-7 and they're going to carry that experience with them. Um, and so just being able to expand that training um, from what we had initially designed, which was visiting staff, to being able to really see how we could offer it to more people within the institution, um, that that would be a lesson learned for us. Um, moving on to uh, technical assistance, um, you know, having a team of folks who are experts in the field and who've helped so many folks um, like ourselves with their grant projects in the past, um, it's just been hugely helpful. Um, getting to hear from other grantees, 
you know, who are operating different sorts of programs, hearing what's, what it's like for them, having that community has been wonderful. Um, and just again, you know, having that problem solving help as we're going through this time of COVID has been wonderful. Um, and I know uh, Lisa Hall, our, our partner at, at DOC, also had um, some thoughts about those benefits, uh, technical assistance. So I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Milo. We have depended heavily on our technical assistance. And to give this a little more context for the audience, in addition to COVID-19 restrictions with um, limiting public access to the institutions, for those of you that don't remember, this summer on the um, West Coast, we had extensive wildfires. And during that time period within the Salem area, we had to evacuate four correctional institutions, which we have never, ever had, had to do within our history. So we had many displaced adults in custody who were participating in the PIO2 program that had established telephone and visiting contact with their loved ones and their children, and then they had to be evacuated to a very large institution and did not have access to the, to the adult in custody phone system. So there was a break in the um, facilitation of the program. And many times, um, to give Pathfinders, our partners, credit, they were kind of the in-between between the children and their adult, their adult parent in custody to relay messages that your parent is doing well, they don't have access to the telephone or to the video um, because they've been um, relocated to another institution, but they're safe. So that was really critical and important in providing children stability to know that their parent, um, who's no longer at their home institution, was moved, that they were safe and were no longer in the path of the wildfire. So our technical assistance has been extremely important to us. We've pivoting, I can't understand the strength of that word. Um, we were allowed um, to redesign the program on the fly to be able to meet our clients' needs as well as the children. And we were very, very, we have a lot of gratitude for being allowed to amend the program to meet the needs of our parents and children. And we can't um, stress that enough, that if you have a question, there is no such thing as a qu silly question for your technical advisor. Sherry, would you like to add anything before we move on? No, I just like that last part that you said, Lisa. That is true. We've asked lots of, of what some might think of silly questions and have been um, met with, uh, with much respect and much um, gratitude for our desire as a, as a team with Oregon Department of Corrections and the Pathfinder Network in, a, in combination with our TA to really um, throw, you know, what I call mud at the wall and take what sticks and, and move and pivot and be able to do that. So there was really nothing that we proposed that didn't get talked out. Um, and so we were really grateful for that, that it didn't feel like we had barriers with in working with the TA, that it was really a, a, a collaborative effort to really get our parents and our children what they needed. Great. Thank, thank you, Sherry. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa, Sherry, Sherry and um, Malo, for sharing your experience in uh, talking about, you know, pivoting and lessons learned as you're implementing your program. You can expect if you have a program for three years, there will be some barriers to overcome. And, and uh, some great lessons learned. And it was really good to just hear you all speak to how you were able to make it work given external factors, internal agency factors, and so forth. So thanks again. So for next steps, um, grantees should work with their TA coach, Val and I, to set up their monthly call. Val and I have emailed each grantee point of contact up until today to schedule the first TA call. If you haven't received an email, please check your junk box or reach out uh, to the person that is noted as the point of contact or your grant application. If you haven't received an email, feel free to uh, just note in the um, 
chat box or the Q&A box that you haven't received the email, and we will make sure that we reach out to you um, by close of business tomorrow. If not, after this presentation. Um, during your first TA call, your coach will review your proposal with you and identify if there has been any changes to your grant program plan, including um, partners or the point of contact. Um, as mentioned previously, we'll share the P&I guide with grantees by the second or third monthly call, and you'll work with your grant team, um, uh, and we'll work with your grant team to plan the rollout for uh, the grant using the P&I guide. So the P&I guide is a tool that will be used to guide your TA. Um, it's a really good tool, as uh, mentioned um, by Milo and a few others, in terms of really helping you think through um, next steps and what to do as part of your grant. So now we'll open it up for questions from the group. Feel free to include or drop any questions you may have. Uh, like Lisa mentioned, no question is a bad question. <laughs> Um, so, again, if there's any questions or concerns um, that you're interested in, please uh, feel free to drop a line in the chat box or the Q&A box. Okay. And I'll give a few minutes. Okay, I see one, um, is there a requirement to complete a planning and implementation guide and a procedural guide? Um, so the planning and implementation guide is strongly encouraged for grantees to complete. Your TA that you'll be receiving every single month, because you'll have at least one TA call per month, in addition to, uh, as I mentioned before, some peer learning opportunities. Um, those TA sessions are guided by your planning and implementation guide. So uh, during the calls, we'll be walking through the guide, documenting information, talking through challenges, identifying what may be good, some good resources uh, for you in terms of thinking through the implementation of your grant program, um, identifying, you know, where there may be um, some opportunities to establish buy-in, uh, from different stakeholders and leadership so we can uh, move the grant program forward. Okay, we have another question came in, um, and I believe this one is uh, for our OJJDP program managers. Um, it says that we do not currently have a quarterly performance report by October 1st through 20, uh, I'm, I think this the year is maybe wrong, but it said October 1st, 2020 through uh, December 31st, 2020, uh, showing in grants.gov. Is this intentional or should we be contacting grants.gov um, help desk? So I'm, uh, just for clarification, are you saying that you've seen a performance quarterly report for this time period? Okay, so I think the question is, is more so of whether or not there's been a performance uh, uh, performance measurement report due as of right now. Um, Kathy uh, or James, do you mind maybe jumping in and sharing a little bit about performance uh, management reporting and, and when it's due? Hi, Erica. Um, yeah, I can offer a little bit of insight, and then um, it, James can, can certainly add to it if he 
He has additional guidance. So there was an email that was sent out to all grantees, um, I think the very last part of January. So if you're not getting these types of communications, please let your grant manager know. It may have come, and it was an automated message, so it would not have been sent out by James or myself. It would have been automatically sent by the Just Grant system, or it would have been an automated message from the PMT folks. But it would have been sent out probably like the very last few days in January. So if you're not getting Gov delivery emails, and if you're not getting these automated messages which which contain this type these types of guidance, um, please let us know immediately um, because the question was answered in that email. <laughs> so just really want to make sure you guys are getting all of the communication that you need. So I'm just going to read verbatim from that email that was already distributed. Um, so the deadline for reporting is the 28th of February. Grantees with an award start date of 2020, which I presume all of you are, will submit their progress narrative report exclusively in Just Grants. You're not required to complete a PMT report. There's a link in the email that says to refer to the performance reporting e-learning video to learn how to complete your report. And if you have any questions, you can contact either the Just Grants Help Desk or you can contact um, your grant manager. So what that kind of means, and that was just a very small snippet. It's like a two-page email. It's filled with guidance and links and other helpful stuff. Um, but if you are a 2020 award recipient and you've logged into Just Grants and you are not able to see that survey, which is um, basically your narrative. It's a weird way to call it that, but it's, it's going to be called the survey. You click on the survey, you'll see the questions, you'll complete it, you'll submit it, and that wraps up your reporting requirement for the period of October through December. If you are a 2020 recipient, you log into Just Grants and you don't see the survey link, that means there's a glitch in the system and you should contact um, the Just Grants Help Desk maybe copy your grant manager on that email. Um, what I've been doing with some of my award recipients who have gone into Just Grants and they don't see the link, so there's nothing, there's literally nothing to complete. I have a narrative template. I've just been emailing that to them and asking them to complete it. The questions are similar um, and we kind of do it that way. But ultimately you do want the system to be more responsive. So it is really a technical glitch you can just reach out to the Just Grants Help Desk. Um, but also, you really want to make sure that you're getting this guidance sent to your email boxes so you can be aware of any changes or glitches that are coming up. Thank you, Kathy. And um, again, if you're having any trouble there, um, the Help Desk um, could assist with the Just Grants information. Um, so we have a, another question, and this is for um, the Parenting Inside Out Phase 2 folks. So Lisa, uh, Sherry, and uh, Milo. Um, someone is interested in hearing you speak more about the bound curriculum and the mail packets that um, are sent to families. Sherry Milo, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, this is Milo, and um, so we're we're fortunate to be um, building our our phase two program off of the evidence based parenting inside out curriculum, um, which I know that some of you um, will also be using in your programming, um, and I see some other great um, you know parenting curriculums um, that folks are going to be using. So I think, you know, for us, we, um, we took our in-person workshops um, and initially broke them into um, kind of monthly packets that we sent in that would have um, some, you know, guided um, journal prompts, some activities that would mirror some of what would be happening um, in the classroom setting. Um, on the same themes, um, but as we kind of went forward, um, just the, the added uh, work and the unknowns that come in of, 
trying to navigate mailing in and out of the prisons, especially when there were COVID-related um, restrictions to access. Um, we found that with our, you know, kind of third iteration of it, that being able to provide everything for the program um, at the beginning would just give folks um, more of what they needed, less chance that they would get, you know, transferred to another institution because of a fire and lose their workbook. Um, and because we are moved, we moved to this more remote um, by phone model, they'd be able to just bring their workbook for every phone um, coaching session they had, and, and it would just left to less um, opportunity for for things to be missing or or not um, not there. So um, I think that to be honest, the workbook is still a work in progress. Um, we want to make sure that it's working for people. Um, and so I would really say that it's, it's a wonderful tool, um, uh, but it's not where the program starts and ends. Um, we still have, you know, weekly coaching sessions by phone where um, as our coaches really get to know their participants, um, there's a lot of individualization that happens to see how they kind of work through the workbook with the participant. You know, some folks, um, they can just kind of rock it through it on their own and then they want to share what they've learned and other people, it's, you know, we're going to walk through these questions one by one together, um, do some role plays. So, you know, I think creating it in a way that, you know, depending on what kind of access you would still have to participants, um, just really being mindful of, of, yeah, what are things that they can do on their own and what are things um, they could do in community with peers, what are things that they, you know, really would benefit from having that coach conversation um, with. If there's any, um, anything, you know, more specific on that front that you have questions about, um, we'd be happy to, to talk through it um, or follow up um, after, after the session as well. And Milo, I would just, oh, this is Sherry, and I would just add to that that the workbook is really, um, was just one of those pivots that we made to um, help keep the very basic things that they would need to be um, relatively successful in continuing with uh, the check-ins with their coaches. But like Milo said, um, plans are very individualized. So what the facilitator would have access to or the coach would have access to in an in-person workshop where, you know, one participant might talk about having only toddlers and one participant may have teenagers, um, an in-person would allow for the coach to really um, access their resources to really help that that parent and child, whereas the workbooks are very much just our, um, what would they need to be the bare minimum of being able to open those conversations and whatnot, we, we would just never be able to put everything in a workbook that would be needed for them to, you know, have everything that they need. So it was just a way to keep, um, you know, the, the fires and the moving between institutions meant that sometimes mail was at one institution waiting to be delivered because of COVID restrictions, and the AIC was now at a completely different institution. So it was just one way to, to meet that need. Thanks, um, Sherry and Milo. There was a question of whether or not you'll be willing to share the workbook. So I'm not sure how you guys, uh, you know, obtain the workbook, was it purchased, or do you have duplicates, but there is someone who's interested in kind of taking a look at the workbook as well. I think on the last, one of the last slides that you had has our email address. Um, and if you email us, um, then we can uh, kind of share with you, it's really a collaboration of, a, of many different things that we put together and we could definitely provide you with the resources that we use to kind of collaborate what, um, what we needed for our program. And this is Lisa and I just want to um, keep in mind that this um, new process is growing and evolving and we're constantly making changes and improvements to it. So this is not the final product. 
Um, this has been quite the journey for us. So as we continue to move forward in these current circumstances, um, things hopefully will continue to improve so that we can have a really high quality service. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you guys so much again. Um, there's another question which is maybe more so geared to our OJJDP program managers, and it's more so of um, learning about how to access the required training for the grant as the point of contact. Um, I think it was shared that it was an email blast, but um, they still haven't received um, information regarding training or haven't, they haven't been able to access the required training for the grant as the point of contact. Um, this is James. Can you guys hear me? We can, James. Okay. So um, I'm not sure who the program manager is of the particular grantee that's asking the question, but if I'm your program manager or rather it's Kathy, I would just send a direct email to either one of us who, what, or whoever is your grant program manager and just say, this is the problem that I'm having. What is the specific training that you're talking about so that we can work with you on getting it resolved? It may be that we need to put you in touch with our OCFO office, or we may need to put you in touch with the IT. So just send us an email on those specifics. Please be sure to include your full name and contact number and your full grant number so that we don't have to do a lot of back and forth. We can try to get the issue resolved quickly. Thank you so much, James. And uh, on the next slide, um, it does have the contact information for the program managers. Um, as well as the TTA coaches. Um, so if you're having issues getting the training that you need um, as the grant point of contact, please reach out to the OJJDP program manager um, that you're assigned to. And um, like James mentioned, uh, he'll be able to work with you in resolving that. Um, so the next question that we got is, very much a technical assistance question in, in, in terms of, you know, when um, developing your grant proposal, you may have some positions that, you know, you're hiring for or initially intend to hire for, but having a difficult time filling. Um, so my, my uh, response to this would be there's definitely um, an opportunity to work with your a TA coach to identify some different strategies for recruitment. Um, oftentimes what I find um, in uh, instances like this is working with, uh, say for instance, if it's for a therapist position, um, working with the local um, uh, council on therapy for the city or the state where you reside to post an announcement or um, a lot of times it may be um, a coordinating body um, within a state or national that you can post um, a position and uh, do some recruitment that way. Um, if there's any modification to what you originally proposed in your grant, whether it's the positions that you're hiring for or the actual curriculum that you're using or anything that's key components of your program that you plan in to change, that is definitely something that should be consulted with your OJJDP program manager. And as a TA coach, um, our goal is to try to, as much as possible, to get you to be able to implement your program as originally designed, but we definitely understand that things um, can change and it can create barriers to doing so, and that's why we'll work with you and OJJDP to uh, identify a solution um, when that does come up. Okay. Uh, there's a question about the planning and implementation guide. Um, what I would say um, with regards to completion or final deadline, um, generally with grantees, it could take about six um, to upwards of nine months to kind of go through the, um, the actual planning and implementation guide. 
Um, as I mentioned before, this is an evolving document. So as things change within your program, um, these, this document should be updated. So that it's always reflecting as what is currently happening in your program. Um, so this is a document that you will visit often throughout your grant program. Um, but what we find generally in terms of close to completion is about six to nine months. But given that it's COVID and a pandemic happening, we understand that it may take a little longer to start rolling things out. And we will work with each grantee to make sure that um, they're able to do so in a manner that works well for their system and their partners. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, but again, if, if things do come to your mind um, after this webinar, please feel free to uh, reach out to your OJJDP program manager or your technical assistance coach. As mentioned earlier, every grantee uh, point of contact should have received an email from the TA coach to schedule the first call, TA call, which will start um, in March. Um, if you haven't received the email, uh, please um, make notation in the Q&A or chat box so we can make sure that we do contact you. Um, so that concludes uh, today's webinar. I want to thank the grantees and partners for their participation, as well as all our speakers today um, for sharing some insight and excitement for the rollout of the uh, fiscal year 2020 uh, grant program. So contact information is listed here on the last slide if you have any additional thoughts or questions. Other than that, have a wonderful afternoon um, and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.